they were both pretty intense. Sam spent his life shooting photos, but Mom said he got nervous being in front of the camera. I guess we're all afraid of something. Instead of hiding from death, Sam seemed to go out of his way to meet it. Dawn, I promise, you'll never forget this weekend. Yes, sir. These memories are gonna last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Am I gonna have to shoot anything? It's a hunting trip, Dawn. Shooting is strongly encouraged. Perfect. It's gonna rain the whole weekend, isn't it? I will never forget this weekend, Dad. That's the spirit. Okay, got it. I'm gonna take some pictures, okay? Just be careful. The camera's older than you are. Aw. You're right, Dad. It's starting to clear up. Still freezing, though. take a picture of you. I definitely won't be moving. Are you done yet? Hey! <laughs> That's a keeper. Uh, nothing quite like being outside. I'm just saying, I'm not always going to be here, Don. You'll need to remember this stuff, if you want to survive. I'll be fine, Dad. You know who else thought he was going to be fine? Dad! Good eyes, Don. Before you take the shot, let me get a picture of him. Dad, I... I... Just... Let me get behind you. Do I have to do this? Don, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to survive, you need to be strong. Great shot, Don! <laughs> I'm proud of you, Don. Always remember that, okay? Dad, it's twitching. I think That's it's... That's totally so normal, Don. Just focus on the camera. Try not to think about- Dad! Oh! Of all these stories, that's the one I wish most that my mom had told me.
After Sam died, my mom and Edie got really close. They'd both lost a lot. Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone? Like something funny was happening, but only he could see it. I think he saw things the rest of us don't. sweetie. Hello? Sam, I told you I don't want to talk right now. I wonder what he saw. I don't want Gregory to hear this. I wish he could have told us about the world he saw. everything.
Good luck, Kay. Love, Sam. I can't imagine my mom ever writing poetry, and yet... A poem for Gus, who always said the wedding was a bad idea. Our father never hit us kids, at least not very hard, before the day my brother said with teenage disregard that he'd be dead before he'd see a wedding in our yard. Father made him come, of course, but Gus stood far apart, just flew his kite and bottled up the storm inside his heart. I tried to talk him out of it, but though he'd never met her, we don't need a stepmom, were the words that I I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. here. But Gus declined, and as a sign held up his middle finger. The wind picked up, and panicked geese appeared and quickly went. But all the humans did that day was go inside the tent. Rain came down in buckets then, but no one seemed afraid that nature might destroy the tent our dad had crudely made. The thunder sounded much too close and full of angry power, but all my father said to this was, Make the music louder! I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea, and foam. But I didn't, until we found you. She never talked about him, but mom told me once if I was a boy, they were going to name me Gus. My mom moved up to the loft after her brothers died. At the time, it was as far away as she could get.
Religion was another thing my mom never talked about, but I think it helped her a lot after her dad died. She spent a summer building houses in Calcutta, where she met my dad, Sanjay. My mom moved to India a week after graduation and got a job teaching English. Lewis was born a year later. <gasps> when my dad died, I don't think mom knew where else to go. I'm sure Edie was happy to have her back. The house had to get a little bigger, but Edie was used to that. And for a while, things were good, almost normal. But it didn't last. The beginning of the end was Milton's 10th birthday, when Edie gave him a castle. After Milton disappeared, the only thing he left behind was a room full of paintings. Milton Finch in The Magic Paintbrush. I was four when Milton disappeared. Mom spent months searching for my brother. Then she sealed the doors. Thank you. 
whatever Milton had found in the house. Mom didn't want it getting out. Mom definitely blamed Edie, but I think Lewis blamed himself. After he graduated, he just spent more and more time in his room until Mom got him a job at the cannery. Everyone always told me to stay out of Lewis's room, except Lewis. Lewis's room smelled very, very familiar. That part of him lived on. He was so proud of being Indian. I think for him, it was a way to be something other than just a finch. Lewis and I spent a lot of time playing games together, but he was surprisingly bad at them. He died a lot. Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life. He kept working at the cannery, but he withdrew part of himself. In our sessions, I saw the same behavior. His mind began to... wander. I asked him to describe it. He said he started small, imagining a labyrinth. He'd feel his way about, then something moved. Bats and toads. And things that have not names. He knew it was all in his head. But he took it very seriously. I had hoped he'd find himself. But he found something more. I worried about him then. Daydreaming at the cannery. I spoke with his boss, but he said Lewis had become a model employee. Methodical, tireless, focused. Like a whole new Lewis. So I let him go on. I even encouraged him. It seemed very promising at first. He told me he'd made a new friend.
on the edge of a city he named Lewis Cleveland. He built the city up slowly, brick by brick. Then he made musicians. And songs for them to play. He talked about starting a band. And he was always humming something. Every day his imagination grew stronger. He no longer spoke at the cannery. But his chopping was as reliable as ever. Then one day it struck him that all the cheering crowds, even the stones under his feet, were all in his imagination. So he could do whatever he wished. He held an election for mayor. And he won. They begged him to stay, but his mind was already wandering. It became a game for him. He'd conquer a city, then immediately push on. New Louisville. St. Louis. He started drifting away from our reality. Minneapolis, until one day he forgot to go home from the cannery. Even as his mother pleaded with him, part of Lewis kept sailing on. In Lewisburg, he heard rumors of a handsome queen. The queen was on her own quest for radiant rainbow. Followed the sound of her. Electric sitar. His chase led him to a golden palace east of the sun and west of the moon. Even then, his logic remained sound. He knew the world was all in his imagination. But he was so proud of having created it. In his own eyes, he'd become something greater than a king. For someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. And then it struck him that the real Lewis was not the one chopping salmon, but the one climbing the steps of a golden palace. My imagination is as real as my body, he told me. It was hard to argue with him.
he began to forget the world we know. I think it pained him to remember Lewis, the cannery worker. He began to despise the man with a royal contempt. I still thought I could save him. Even after he said he was being crowned king over all the lands of wonder. The palace would be packed with his companions. Calico had insisted on inviting him. His queen waited, holding his crown. There's only one thing left to do. Bend down his head. And the rest I think you know. Mrs. Finch, your son was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. My brother was really cool. I wish you could have met him.